No. We, we, we need to get started. We need to get started. Okay. Plus. Oh, that's right. My wife is downstairs watching. She got sucked into The Flash on Netflix. I haven't done that one yet. There's eight seasons or seven seasons. There is a lot of seasons of The Flash. But that'll keep her busy for a while. Oh, it will keep her busy for a while. But should we talk about Windows 365 tonight? Should we start yeah. going so our wives don't kill us? Let, let, let's do it. Um, okay. I mean, I mean, I, I'd appreciate not to be like strangled from behind at some point tonight. So that that would be wonderful. As um, long as you keep your camera on, you're safe because the evidence would be caught live on YouTube. Good point. And she doesn't know that, so. We'd be oh. even better off. <laughs> so, where would you like to start with Windows 365? Or would you like me to start with Windows 365? Ooh, so I am so confused that, like, we, we sat down to kind of talk about this tonight. And, uh, you know, as much as we kind of talk about how we don't prepare for anything, like, we, we, do, we do try to, you know, we'll maybe try and pull up some links ahead of time or at least find like an about me page, things like that. And I've been going on and on. We should really talk about cloud PCs and good luck finding anything in Microsoft docs land about a cloud PC. When it comes to Microsoft 365, if you don't know whatever kind of asinine labeling has been put <laughs> on docs. Uh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely a crazy thing. Like we'll get into the provisioning experience for this thing and the provisioning experience effectively starts with, Hey, go to a page in device management that has a tab that says all cloud PCs. I challenge you to find that documentation inside of docs.ms through a simple Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo search, or anything like that. Uh, you will probably want to just gouge your eyes out first. Um, so I, I, I think it would be helpful to kind of ground the conversation in just what is a cloud PC, and then maybe what are all the various names that you might want to look up at a later time. Like if you're coming back to this a week from now, and you're somebody who's like, oh, cool, they talked about cloud PCs. Well, cloud PCs might not exist in a week. They might be called something else. Yeah, and I actually struggled with this as well. Like, you told me that, and I was like, oh, I can find it. I'm not going to go, um, like, specifically to docs.com and search for it. So I just started throwing in Windows 365 as well. Uh, and to your point, Windows 365, and especially if you start throwing Cloud PC in front of it, I would say you can get to the product page. You can get to the Microsoft.com slash Windows 365 product page. For whatever reason, Docs does not come up. Like, The Verge comes up before <laughs> it. Um, yep. Computer World comes up before it. An ad at .info.com comes up before it. Let me see. Page 2. More product pages, um, more ads, more ads. Wikipedia. Wikipedia comes up for Microsoft 365 first. Um, and I think part of this could be, and this is what I discovered this tonight as we got started with this, uh, is that there was a name change within all of this uh, cludgery. Is cludgery a word? <laughs> Uh, um, cludgery is probably not a word. Uh, to bludgeon someone is a word, and I feel like I'm just gonna like you're just gonna bludgeon, bludgeon myself. Somebody. Um, so within all of this, you used to have. I'm pretty sure I couldn't find the specific documentation, so somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. But you used to have Microsoft or my Microsoft, all these 365 things. You used to have Windows 365 E3 and Windows 365 E5. These were the subscription versions of Windows. Uh, was Windows 10, went to Windows 11. Um, but if you went out and bought Microsoft 365 E3 or Microsoft 365 E5, 
and I'm sure we've talked about this before, it included Office 365 E3, EMS, Enterprise Mobility and Security uh, E3, and Windows 365 E3. Um, E5, respective versions. Office 365 E5, EMS E5, Windows 365 E5. Um, I believe, I don't think it was just Windows E3 and Windows E5. What we found tonight as we went out and started looking is that the subscription version of Windows is no longer Windows 365. It's Windows Enterprise <laughs> E3, Windows Enterprise E5, and then you do have the Windows Enterprise E3 in Microsoft 365 F3. That's yeah, not confusing so, at all. But it's even more confusing because you said it's Windows Enterprise. It's not Windows Enterprise. It's Windows 11 Enterprise is kind of how you would search for it and get to it. And then within Windows 11 Enterprise, you have those multiple editions that you talked about, which is Windows Enterprise E3, which is the Windows 11 Enterprise E3 upgrade for Windows 11 Pro that adds on things like Azure Virtual Desktop and Windows 365 instances. So your your, your mileage may vary with these kinds of things. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think like starting with... Cloud PC, which is what we're really talking about at the end of the day, I think, um, isn't a great way to do it. Like you have to kind of come in through a different angle and potentially look for Windows 11 Enterprise and then find the SKU that's associated with that, which would be part of a Microsoft or, yeah, which would be part of a Microsoft 365 plan um, or kind of an add on license on top of that. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> fun yeah, stuff. It's all, it's all kind of interesting. I was able to eventually get to it through docs.com. Um, and once you go to docs, and I don't know, do you have this one pulled up yet, Scott? Let me send you this link, and we'll jump over and just start looking at docs, kind of like we do a lot. Um, there is a doc, and I don't know what you have up now, but I'm going to jump over to your browser window. Um where what you have up now is those Windows Enterprise plans. So there you can see that E3, the E5, the E3, and the E5. But that other link I just sent you um, is what is Windows 365. And it has changed in that Windows 365 is now that cloud-based service automatically creating new Windows virtual machine, in parentheses, cloud PCs. Uh, so in in parentheses, it, it is there, but, but it's kind of, I don't, I don't want to harp on it a ton, but like, this is kind of just one of those crazy things that comes up is you go, great. What is windows 365? But if you start going into like how to guides for things, like I want to go into a how to guide for end user experience for windows 365 enterprise, which equates to cloud PC. Like these things are clearly called cloud PCs. Like there is a doc for access a cloud PC. You go down to next steps. There's cloud PC lifecycle. There's resize a cloud PC. Like it remotely manage cloud PCs. Like I, I don't understand. <laughs> it's just a cloud PC. Why can't you call it a cloud PC and cloud increase PC. your SEO? Right. But, and leave whatever. Windows 365 as Windows itself where the service is cloud PC. Yeah. Uh, I mean, who, who knows? So you need parentheses cloud PCs, except when they're not parentheses cloud PCs. Uh, but really what we're talking about is per user licensing that can be assigned to users within your tenancy. And by having that license assignment available to those users, it's giving them access rights to virtual machines that run either in Azure Virtual Desktop or within the Windows 365 cloud PC service. I'm going to call it that for lack of a better name. It's really like AVD in the background. It's kind of like AVD yourself, maybe versus managed AVD that somebody that, that Microsoft has brought on top of it. Um, and, you know, we're talking about that provisioning experience. So let's go ahead and figure out like license assignment for those users and then once those users have those licenses, what do you need to do to deploy a unit of compute for them, a cloud PC, that then they can go and access from kind of anywhere, right? A a any device. 
Right. And it is like the whole cloud PC thing is weird. You mentioned Azure Virtual Desktop. We won't get into it a ton. Um, what I noticed, I actually noticed this today. Uh, Windows 365 Cloud PC is essentially a Microsoft managed version of Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, the services, 100%. <laughs> the services work the same way. And I actually caught this today. I was reading through my blog posts and there was some new announcements that came around like improved uh, multimedia streaming and some improvements around Azure Virtual Desktop. And there yep. were two blog articles that came out simultaneously. One that exact same titles, only one was Azure Virtual Desktop and one was Windows 365. Exact same improvements, everything. It's like, yeah, very clearly, this is just Microsoft managed Azure Virtual Desktop, um, making it simpler. I would say making it simpler to stand up a virtual desktop environment. Oh, 100%. Like, it's it's totally a great idea to have kind of an over-the-top managed service this way. Uh, you know, like, when you need the power of and, and configurability and flexibility that comes from Azure Virtual Desktop, like, I want to deploy virtual machines for my users with not only my custom imaging, but I also maybe need them to land in specific virtual networks within my Azure environment. I want to have full control over routing and kind of all the things from uh, from those virtual machines. Totally makes sense, right? Like, like yep. you can go down that path and you can have that uh, that kind of functionality. But if you are, I think, uh, a Windows 365 business kind of consumer, uh, maybe you're somebody who's uh, not familiar with Azure to the point where you're really deep on virtual networking and subnetting and route tables and getting your access all configured. And like, really, you don't want to, like, you just don't want to manage things that way. Like, if you're looking for an over the top service where you buy an add on license for a user, and then you pay a charge for having a unit of compute up and ready to go. Uh, like we'll go. Let me. I'll hop over to the uh, the pricing page here uh, for the calculator. You know, we're going to take a look at what some of those options are. Uh, so it defaults to business when you go into the calculator, but you can kind of switch over, go into the enterprise calculator. You'll see here, like you're picking a set of options around things like CPU, RAM, storage, and you're just going to pay per user per month uh, that fee to have that unit of compute up running and available. So if you see something here and you're getting into it and you go like, you know, I really need like 16 virtual CPUs or I need uh, GPUs for my users, like Maybe I'm doing remote media processing. Like I'm, I'm not watching videos on YouTube, but I'm actually trying to do like remote video editing, things like that. And I need a GPU on my device. Well, like this might not be the over the top service for you. Maybe you need some of the configurability and flexibility that comes from something like Azure or Virtual Desktop itself. So you kind of go down that path and do those things. Um, I think the really nice thing here is you don't have to choose one or the other. You could really kind of do both. You could have a segment of your users that is in the over-the-top managed service. And if that's okay for them, like, why not go down that path? It'll arguably be cheaper for you at the end of the day. Like somebody's already figured out how to do all the heavy lifting for you when it comes to automation around uh, provisioning those machines, managing them, how they come up, how they come down, all those kinds of things, profile management, like it's all just figured out for you. And then for those more specialized use cases, you go down the other path and you do Azure Virtual Desktop. Like, yep. uh, it, it's all upside. Right. The, Once you figure out what a cloud PC is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the other time I've seen the Azure Virtual Desktop come in handy, and I'll call this out as another difference, um, when you go get Windows 365, kind of like you see here on the pricing calculator, uh, you're going to pick that instance size, and that instance is dedicated to a user. You assign this to the user. You can't share uh, 8 CPU, 512 gigs of storage, 32 gigs of RAM, uh, cloud PC, Windows 365 PC, between multiple users. However, if you go spin up Azure Virtual Desktop, you can spin those up as shared instances 
where multiple people could share the same uh, instance. So if you have people maybe working different shifts or uh, they have that ability to share some of those resources, that is one other area where I've seen Azure Virtual Desktop make a little bit more sense, be able to come out a little bit ahead from a pricing perspective is being able to leverage a shared resource across multiple users uh, versus Windows 365, where it is this machine, this license is dedicated to only this person. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that nails it down pretty good. So do you want to go through, you've seen the pricing calculator. Do you want to go through and actually spin one of these up and see what it looks like from the admin side of things? Yeah, let, let's do that. And uh, I'm going to lean on you for this part because, like I said, the documentation's useless. I can't even go in here and figure out how to do it. So um, <laughs> thankfully, we're recording this video that I can go back and refer to later. You can go watch. So just to start, if you are going to buy the licensing, you looked at the pricing calculator already. Uh, if you're in the admin center, um, what you'll find is you have that Windows 365. So you really are looking not for cloud PC, um, but you're looking for that Windows 365 license. Here you have what you just looked at, business. You have business with hybrid benefit. We don't need to get into that. That's all licensing around Windows, if you already have Windows or not, um, Windows Enterprise. Once you click on details for one of these, that's when you get in and you can start picking what you want. So you can go select a given plan, uh, four CPUs, 120 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs. I can't remember which one's my favorite. One of these, how many licenses you want, give you that price, and you can go in and purchase that license. Once you get that license, uh, then you have to go in and assign the license to your users. It's just like any other Microsoft 365 product where you have to go into Azure AD, uh, you have to go into your user, and I had all these up at one point in time, go into your user, uh, go into licenses, and my user, I've already actually assigned one of these licenses that I have. So down here at the bottom, you can see I have a Windows 365 Enterprise 4V CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, 128 gig hard drive. Uh, yep. It's just a license you have to assign. That does not get you immediately to your cloud PC. This just tells you that this user is allowed to license it. Yeah, um, I, I think that's an important thing there. If effectively, you've done access rights at this point, but you haven't done anything to actually provision the unit of compute that's now theoretically allocated to that user on the back end. Um, so you've got to kind of go to that logical next step to make that happen. Right. And that was when I first stood this up, um, that was one of the things I did. I was like, great, I have my license. I have my Windows 365 PC. Uh, one of the things they'll tell you is you can go to windows365.microsoft.com. So I went there and I logged in and I was like, I don't see my cloud PC. What's going on? I have one now. You'll see one assigned. <laughs> so then I had yeah. to go find that um, ever elusive documentation that you talked about of terms of I have the license. I thought I had it. What am I missing? Next yeah. step. Yeah, it, it's it's that whole disconnect between per user assignment of a license and then the admin actions that need to happen on the other side. So really like doing that first step just says, oh, your user can get into windows365.microsoft.com and that gives them the ability to see a cloud PC should they have one. Exactly. But if they don't have one, they're not going to see anything there. Yep. So... Once you dig through the documentation, turns out it is buried all the way down here under your endpoint manager. So, <laughs> like, good luck finding this, right? It's it's just right. part of into randomly, but sure, okay. I, I mean, I get it. It is an endpoint. It is a device that you are likely going to want to have other policies associated with it. Like, it makes complete sense, right? You're going to have some type of configuration profile around deployment. You might have custom images. Uh, you might want to do conditional access, like all those kinds of things. Like 
it, it's it's Windows. You're going to manage it like any other device. It's just a little bit weird to think about like, Oh, I'm not managing existing devices. I'm actually using this as a my provisioning experience for new ones as well. Right. And I think that's even where I got confused going back to the naming. Was this, I do know, it's under this menu right here by provisioning, has always been Windows 365. Um, but before Windows 365 also used to be that skew of Windows that was the subscription one. <laughs> Um, so it got a little confusing, but in theory, they've kind of sort of fixed all of that now. Uh, as you want to go start building these out, it is this single menu item underneath Endpoint Management in Windows 365. And then you get all of your different tabs across the top. Naturally, I would assume let's go left to right because that's the way I read things. Why not? Exactly. So there's a little bit of an overview here. Um, Windows 365, provisioning it, all of that. Next up was all cloud PCs. I was like, great, all cloud PCs. Originally, I didn't have any. You'll actually see I do have two of them out here now. This is mine. And this is where you'll also see this virtual machine is assigned to me. Um, I also have a device name here. It's not provisioned. It's another one of those types. Uh, it's assigned to a demo user one. Um, if you don't have anything here, all right, let's skip on to the next one. Next up was my provisioning policies. And this is where, again, when you first start, you're not going to have anything here. Fortunately, if you found the documentation to get you to this point, you do have a link in here to learn more about it. Um, but we've already learned more about it. Let's go in and start creating the policy. Uh, well, when you create a policy, first thing is a name. So we'll call this R to the cloud policy. Give it a description. I won't lie. I'm horrible about descriptions, so I just don't ever put them in there. <laughs> um, this is Thank where... Goodness they're not a required field for you. Right? It would just be like A, B, C, D, E or something. This is where I actually got stuck the very first time I did this. You will see right here, I do have Azure AD join that is in preview. Originally, for the enterprise version of Cloud PC, this was not an option. Azure AD was only there for the business version. I like enterprise. I did enterprise. So I had to choose this hybrid Azure AD join. And I went to click network and I was like, I don't have an on-premises network. I didn't have a network connection here, so I couldn't actually go in and create my policy. Is everything okay over there? Your wife's not coming to kill you, is she? <laughs> no, uh, more more a dog that I had locked in the room with me that wants to get out desperately now. Oh, of course. So. Um, so the first thing I did when I was creating this I had no network connection here. I was like, wait a minute. I can't do hybrid Azure AD join. I don't have a network here. What's going on? So I like stalled out on my provisioning <laughs> policy right away the first time I was doing this and ended up going back to my devices. If well, you'd, you you'd kind of wonder like, why, why do you need a network policy if you're just going to have a pure cloud-based thing. Like, I, I think that's kind of a natural inclination right. of, of what is the purpose of me having any type of uh, network if really the only other default option is on-premises networking. And if you don't need on-premises, like you kind of look at it and go, why? <laughs> why? And that was a big, I have clients that were disappointed in the fact that enterprise especially did not have Azure AD join. And this is the reason why you ended up needing a network is enterprise, you needed a domain controller to join your PC to. Why enterprise needed a domain controller, or I think you could also do it with Azure Active Directory domain services. Um, I don't know why enterprise needed it and why business didn't. But that was my hangup. 
So welcome you, to artificial licensing constructs. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have a domain controller, and if you want this to be one of those hybrid Azure AD joined, where it's actually joined to your domain controller, synced up to Office 365, you get to skip over device images and go over to on-premises network connection. And this is where I went in and created a on-premises connection. So, so this is like the power tip, right? You just skip right. everything else that's there, and you and don't start, start with, with you don't start with provisioning. You start with networking. Yes, and you go in and you create that hybrid Azure AD join network. Now, the advantage I had is that my domain controller already sits out in Azure. Um, so I was able to go in and we can do a to the cloud and I could go in and pick my subscription and pick my resource group. I think my domain controllers in that one. Don't ask why it's in the demos VNet subnet, not the intelligent one. Failure on yeah, my part. How all good production environment. I could go choose my subnet. This is where my domain controller is. If you're in that environment where your domain controller is on premises and you're trying to spin up the cloud PCs, you're going to have to have some type of express route or site to site VPN connection because your cloud PCs are going to have to be able to reach through whatever Azure subscription you're joining them to to somehow discover your domain controller within that network. Which makes sense. Like we, we are talking about enterprise SKUs of things. So I, I, I don't think that's like too much of a ask to say like, hey, you, you need a domain someplace for these things to get on board with. Um, and, and it's one of those big differences maybe between the enterprise SKU and the business SKU is you don't have this whole kind of rigmarole of, of needing to have a domain to join. Uh, you can just do the, uh, not the hybrid join, but the hybrid registration right, thing. the Azure AD. Uh, and, yeah, I, I always get confused between the <laughs> terminology of join and register and, and all of that, but it, it is a possibility and it's there for you. It's just under a different SKU. Uh, it's it's under those business SKUs. Those business. Well, it was. Now it is under enterprise. I don't know why it took so long to come to enterprise. Well, it's in preview for enterprise. I have not tried it yet. Um, but once you set up that network, it's just going to be your domain information. Uh, type in your domain controller, like mine was intelligent.com, Microsoft.com, whatever that DNS domain name yep. is organizational unit, if you want these deployed into a certain OU, that uh, UPN of an on-premises domain user. So this is not uh, Azure AD user. This is that on-premises UPN password, domain password, so that these could be joined over that network or can communicate over that network to your domain controller. So, so I assume that's kind of it, it's, or it can be just a specialized user with, uh, li like a service principal, a service account with kind of least access privileges. You can just give it rights to that OU, uh, the ability to uh, add new objects into that OU, like uh, yep. Windows things like that. So yeah, this is what mine is. I have an intelligent admin. I don't think I even have this user synced to Office 365. I don't believe this is a valid Office 365 user. Gotcha. Um, yep. It's just an account. Again, I created it just for that domain user, just for joining cloud PCs to my domain controller. Um, so once you have all of that set up, then you can go back to these provisioning policies. Um, before we do that, user settings is something else you can go set up. Uh, this really is, there's not a whole lot here. Um, a name, if you want that user to be local admins, point in time restore, this is actually something new. You can do point in time restores now of these cloud PCs. 
So if you want users to enable it and how frequently those point in time restores or point in time uh, backups get taken. So that's interesting. Like, is that, uh, well, I guess because you're in the, the that kind of over the top managed service, is that just like a uh, like a recovery services kind of thing? I think that's what it's doing. Um, I just saw this. Wow, that's a quality URL right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does that really go to? It's a go.microsoft.com that takes me yep. to Bing. Yep, that's it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so you're not going to get very far with that, are you? 245, is this? I wonder if that's the right one. So let's just try go.microsoft.com. No, uh, that's just a redirector through Bing anyway. Oh. So I don't actually know. Point in time restore. I saw an article come out on this recently, like within the last week or two. Um, allow users to initiate a restore service. Frequency, great, thanks. Um, point in time cloud restore service, Windows 365. We'll see if documentation on this is any better. Ooh, point in time, permit point in time restores. Um, user settings, add frequency of restore points, choose an interval, 10 restore points. So if you do go shorter, you're only gonna be able to keep it for 40 hours if you do the four hour one. Um, yep. I that, would that assume, sounds distinctly like an Azure backup kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and I'm assuming like from that they're just watching their own cost and yeah, yeah, all of that. Overview set in point in time, point in time. They're probably not going to give any specific um, features, but yeah, probably like you said, some ASR uh, settings. Who those get assigned to? So you could in theory do different restore points for different users. Uh, different local admins. So maybe you don't want every user to be a local admin on a cloud PC, just scope to certain users. That's going to be your assignments. Yep. All pretty straightforward. So yeah, those are all device images. I have not done anything with this. Um, device images are if you have your own custom cloud PC images you want to create, it does support a gallery of your own custom images that you can upload. Uh, I just do all the out-of-the-box images. Um, I have not messed around with this or played with this. It just seemed like way more work than it was worth for me. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it's it's another one of those there if you need it kind of things. Like if you just want the standard Windows 11 enterprise image, like great, that's available to you. It's something that that's there and ready. If you need that customized with um, any, any particular software around your environment, or maybe you have an existing VHD that's already out there that you're already deploying for users today, then you can go ahead and pull that VHD over. Uh, there's some weird requirements there. Like I'm, I'm not sure if they've changed along the way either, but you know, it's not a Gen 1 VHD. It's a Gen 2 VHD. You might have to do some conversion and things like that. Uh, but you can bring custom images if needed. So those are great if you have your uh, your your custom software that you need to deploy as part of kind of the out of the box provisioning experience. Um, you know, also great if you're in you know probably more used in environments where you do have that on premises connection available. Like, oh, I need to talk back to. Uh, the management server, like the control and management plane for my AV. And then I've got a custom AV agent and things like that deployed uh, down on my cloud PCs for my users. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I can see it, to your point, being probably a little bit more applicable. Uh, some of that stuff you can do because if you are using Intune, you can also manage all of these with Intune and push out software and policies and updates via Intune as well. Um, but we have user settings now. We have our on-premises network connection now. Uh, now we can finally go in and go back to creating our policy. Uh, so we'll go back and start over again with to the cloud. Uh, Azure AD, again, I have not gone in and tried this yet with an Azure AD 
policy, but if you are doing Azure AD Join now for enterprise, it's just going in, selecting the network, um, East US. So this is, I don't know where an on-premises network connection would come in to an Azure AD Join. Um, that's a little odd. Uh, but if you are doing Azure AD Join, it's just going to be what is the region and that Microsoft network. Um, going back to hybrid, this is that default network that I picked. So you do have a couple different options now um, with enterprise and business. And if you want to do hybrid or just a straight up Azure AD Join. Uh, once you select that network and how you want to do it, this is that image type. So those custom images, this is going to be from that image tab that I just showed you where you can go pick that, or you can do gallery images. And this is what I do. You can select your Windows 11 images with the Microsoft 365 apps uh, or Windows 10 images. The other thing to pay attention to is they do have recommendations here um, based on your size. So if you truly wanted to spin up a cloud PC that was running on one CPU core in two gigs of RAM, you're going to want to pick one of those cloud PCs that are optimized for that ridiculously low amount of resources. Um, anything else, go ahead and pick that two CPU and above image. Yeah, I, like anything else, like be realistic about it. Uh, you, you know, the the pricing really isn't bad <laughs> for how it lines up with, uh, with the units of compute uh, being like CPU, memory, and storage that you're grabbing along the way. Uh, so if you think you're going to have the opportunity to be stingy on those, you're going to pay for it on the other side in just a bunch of frustration. Yep, 100%. So select the image. Great, that image is there. You can move on to configuration. Uh, again, super basic. They really did try to make this simple. Choose the language you want. Um, and then from assignments, it's who gets this PC? Um, are you going to add groups to it? Uh, I thought you could add users to it. Um, I can't remember. Uh, but you can go in, select those groups. So I could go grab this, found it all of the internal intelligent folks or contractors to um, be users that get to receive these cloud PCs, have the option for um, assigning it to it. So I can choose a group, hit select here. Um, next, it's just going to give me that overview and go in and create this new policy. Uh, so just like that, I have a new policy out there um, for going out and provisioning those PCs. I forgot groups are, that's why this was not assigning the PC. This was just assigning that policy. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. So, yeah, all of those policies are there. Then I can go back to my cloud PCs. This one you can see is not provisioned. Um, but all those users have the option to use them. So as you would go and log in now, uh, these would get provisioned. Uh, when that user goes and logs in and starts leveraging that PC. Um, so at this point in time, it's really all stood up. Uh, my demo one user, I should go look at that user. Why that one? Because I noticed I only had one license. I thought I had two licenses in there. Um, this user is assigned one, which is why uh, they show up here. They just don't have a device yet. Um, so I should go over here and let's actually not do that one. Let's do a new in private window and actually go log in with my demo one user. So I can log in. I think that's the password. Oh, see, I haven't been assigned one yet. 
I wonder if that user is not in that group. Scott, I have failed. This is what happens if you don't have a, a cloud PC assigned to you. Let me go back. Well, see, this is why we do this. It is why we do this, because I thought... Let me go see if... There's 11. I wonder if I pulled that user out of that group. Groups, all groups. Let me go look for Windows 11. Cloud PC. Let's go see who's in this group. Zero users. I must have myself in another group. So <laughs> this is where I can go in now, and I should be able to add my demo one user. Select to add it to a group. And I can't remember, again, if I used to be able to do it just by members or if it's always been groups and I was just pulling users in and out of groups. So demo user one is now in that Cloud PC group. Um, if I go back to my devices, Windows 365, um, this demo user has been assigned to it. That provisioning policy, I think I looked at it, it was this Windows 11 Azure AD. Uh, to the cloud, I'm actually gonna go in and switch this. Let's go in and update a group here to Windows 11 Cloud PC and remove this one. I forgot that group existed. Next, update. Because I haven't tried that if a user gets assigned two different policies, what happens? And we'll see how quick that takes effect. There we go. Oh, I did lose my license. So this is what happens now when that user has been in there. That user has been assigned a uh, cloud PC provisioning profile, but they don't have any licenses. So I've been assigned to Cloud PC. I could go in and spin up a Cloud PC, but I need that license, that ability to actually go in and use that uh, Windows 365 Cloud PC that's been assigned to me. And I'm not going to go and buy a new license right now. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's not a whole lot to it. I can go show you this one is the one that I have assigned to me. You can see when I last connected, I have that ability to open this right up in the browser. Um, share printer, microphone, clipboard, alternate keyboard layouts, any of those, and connect. Uh, this is going to go in prompt for username, password. I don't know what my password is. I can go log right into the browser if I wanted to go look it up and we'd be good to go there. The other place you can use these is in your remote desktop. Uh, if you want to do this in a remote desktop client, the important thing to notice, and I'm on a Mac, uh, Windows is gonna be something similar, where these are tied to a workspace. This is not your traditional remote desktop session where you'd go in and, um, add a PC and go type in an IP address or a host name and do that uh, connection via the host name or IP address, you're going to want to go in and add a workspace here uh, where then you could go and like our demo one user we talked about, um, you would be able to go in, type in an email address. That one should have a workspace associated with it. Um, I don't know, it might not work with mine because I already have one there. Uh, but you can go in, add that workspace, and then you connect to it here. So it shows up as that cloud PC. This workspace down here is actually that Azure virtual desktop environment that I have set up as well. Um, so it shows up kind of right alongside of any AVD implementations. At that point in time, it's just double click on it. It's gonna go create that connection, type in your password, and 
log you into that remote desktop environment. Yeah, I, that's no different than AVD, like the whole workspace right. or it's the exact or anything same like thing as AVD. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, I mean, if you want to do other things, like we talked about, this is an Intune. So it is supported to go in to like your Windows platform and create compile, uh, compliance policies, configuration policies, where these could be assigned to those uh, cloud PCs um, because these are going to be assigned based on uh, users, based on devices. At that point in time, a cloud PC is just another computer in your environment. Um, like if I go yeah, I, I can think of a couple of things you'd probably want to do along the way. So, uh, you know, certainly if you're not on a custom image, like maybe there is post provisioning kinds of things you want to do. Like maybe you want to inject software via Intune, things like that. Um, you also mentioned some of the new capabilities around media streaming. Uh, so there's all sorts of kind of uh, AVD fixes, uh, fixes, uh, knobs and levers that you can turn, uh, when it comes to windows clients to make sure that they have an optimal experience for media consumption, be that like YouTube, Facebook, y y you know, watching video, things like that. Um, but also for things like teams, like there, there might be some customizations that you want to make there just to make sure that your users are having the best experience that they can. Like, I think the client tooling has come a long way, like client tooling that allows you to go in and associate a workspace with like the remote desktop client and being able to do things like mic and video pass through. Like it actually, like, it's not like a hundred percent, you're not at the physical machine, but it gets pretty darn close some of the time. So you want to make sure that you have all those kind of fixes rolled out as well. Um, potentially another advantage of just going with the Microsoft images is quite often uh, all of those registry keys and things are preset for you in the Microsoft images, and they won't always necessarily be there in your own. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree with that 100%. And if you do want antivirus, Defender, all of that, um, this was what I was going to show. Like, this is that AVD machine, or not AVD my cloud PC, and you can see it shows up right alongside other virtual machines. Uh, I think these might be some of the VMs sitting like in parallels on my laptop. Uh, it really is just another PC in your environment um, when it comes to managing it via that Microsoft 365 suite. Uh, which is all kind of nice. Uh, so one last thing maybe before we close out. So you, you've already got a PC that's out there and provisioned. Yep. Can you go and is it possible for you as like an admin to nab the VHD for that machine? It is not. There is no way, I don't believe, for me to go snag it. I, I, I'm just wondering, like, like I, I would see some value in that if you could, you, you know, like, hey, a user is having a problem. Can you just download the VHD and load it up in uh, Hyper-V and maybe do some debugging locally? Uh, heck, what happens if you get like ransomware or something like that, or you need to lock that PC down further and you want to make sure you can capture the image for uh, analysis at, at another time? Yeah, that is one thing. Like, you can do a resize on it. Um, so this is, again, that device in... Yeah, you're, you're all the way down to that individual device right now. Right. So here it is. There's that cloud PC. I can do the same, the restart, reprovision. Um, I don't believe... Because somebody asked this the other day of... I can't remember where I was or who I was talking to. Um, but they did ask, like, is there any way you can do your own snapshots or kind of manage your own um, backups of these? And there is not any way that I'm aware of to do that. I can go. Well, I'm, I'm not even thinking snapshots. I, I think things like that are maybe covered with that point in time restore functionality. Like it might not be exactly what you want, but that's built in. 
And if you did want to do a kind of per user backup kind of thing, there's nothing preventing you from deploying your own backup agents on right. these PCs you can do that. And, and, and running things that way. But I, I was thinking, you know, in this era where we've got things like the prevalence of ransomware, you've got security attacks, like, I've been in a lot of organizations where like when a user's PC, like something goes wrong with it or a server in your environment is compromised, it gets shut down immediately, but you might want to do some type of like forensic analysis on that later. So um, who knows? Maybe that's something that's kind of uh, coming on down the road. Yeah, there is not a way that I am currently aware of to get to any of that Um, because it does just kind of sit behind the scenes like i can't go into the device and get to it there's nothing in here um i wouldn't say there's nothing like i don't know if there'd be a rest uh probably wouldn't be a rest endpoint i mean avd it's going to be a managed disk sitting in an azure subscription somewhere yeah no 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 that's that's all good um how about the end user experience? So you've already spun one of these up and, and we don't have to like log into one and, and take a look at it, but well, I can go like, have, you gener- password. Ha- have you generally found like the experience to be decent with them? Like my experience with AVD has been, it, it's pretty much great. Like, uh, you, you know, you and I are on the East coast of the U S and like, I have AVD instances available to me in, uh, East U S and West U S in Europe, like it, they, and they all perform swimmingly. Yeah. I have had really good luck with them. Um, somebody, is this another one the other day? Somebody told me it was like, they were complaining about it being slow or saying that they were really slow. Um, I think it goes back to your point of, um, Really making sure that you're not underpowering it. Uh, It's Windows 10. It's Windows 11. We've seen how that (laughs) performs on minimal hardware. Um, And it's not great. Uh, Again, this is 8 gigs of RAM. It's the 16 gigs of RAM, 8 cores. Um, For me, like I did, I went ahead and logged into it. I mean, the performance in terms of opening up the start menu, searching, opening up an app, uh, it's pretty snappy in terms of jumping into all of these different files. Uh, I don't know what a good, I don't even know which file. I'm not going to open any of my files because I can't remember all of them. (laughs) Probably not a good idea. How about a numbers coloring book? Create a numbers coloring book. Uh, I mean, yeah, who knew? There's templates of coloring books now in Word. Um, It's been quick. Uh, I keep this one around. I do a lot of PowerShell stuff in it. So I'll have this one for running PowerShell scripts, for testing stuff out in Windows. My team's client's usually running in here. Um, So I, spinning it up with enough resources... I have had no issues with the speed. Uh, One thing I haven't tried and done much of is what you had said, the trying to make Teams calls or multimedia or I did try running a game. I did try um, (laughs) like Age of Empires. What was it? Four that came out. Yep. Um, There is no discrete GPU in these. Uh, Like you're running the bare it's like an Intel, um, oh, taskbar is all broken. That's right. Uh, system. Welcome to Windows 11. I mean, your processor is like an Intel Xeon, but I can't remember where graphics cards are now in here. Um, yeah, they're, they're probably just like the virtualized. It's like the Intel, models. yeah. It's yeah. like the onboard Intel graphics card. So if you're thinking you're going to use this for playing games or doing anything that requires like crazy graphics, intensive rendering videos, all of that. Um, I probably would not do that, but your general office work, PowerShell scripts, all of that. Um, functionality has been great for me when it comes yeah, to Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it really is a, a turnkey solution. Um, you've probably still got to do some training with your users. Like, 
don't do things like shut down your cloud PC, <laughs> you know? Well, and even then it should still come right back up. Like it has, they, the... they just, they ought, they just, they, so uh, they were probably waiting for AVD to launch that functionality, like the audio restart. <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried it yet. Oh, I can't even shut it down. Look at that. Well, I mean, you could, right? You could go to the command line and do like a shutdown. And do like the but... shutdown.exe. Don't give yeah. the users any ideas, Scott. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's what I'm here for. Shutdown slash T zero. Perfect. Um, but the updates, like I've gone and manually run the check for updates before. Um, like I'll go check for an update, run updates, let it do the updates, reboot. Uh, I haven't had any problem with that. The biggest hang up, I guess I found with these is if you start getting into, and I don't, I don't frankly know how many more of these Microsoft is going to do, but major updates, um, going from Windows 10 to Windows 11, uh, there was not an upgrade path. I did, like, I had a cloud PC. I was like, let's try this. I went in and, like, downloaded Windows 11 and tried to update Windows 10 to Windows 11 in the environment, and it all blew up on me. And yeah, not, not very happy. Died. Um, <laughs> I had to go in and just create a new uh, provisioning policy. So I had like a Windows 10 provisioning policy and a Windows 11 provisioning policy and went in and like, I didn't even have to destroy it. Um, You can do like the the reprovision option in here. Mm -hmm. And if you have switched, and I guess this is also something to be aware of, if you've switched that profile that's assigned to you in your provisioning profiles and you do a reprovision, it'll it destroys your VM and goes and grabs that new provisioning profile and rebuilds it with a new provisioning profile. Um, so there was no upgrade path that was essentially blow away my Windows 10 VM and stand up a brand new Windows 11 VM. Uh, but no, I've been I've been happy with it for me I like this better than running a VM on my laptop. Uh, one from a heat perspective, from a performance perspective, uh, even from like a PowerShell perspective. Um, most of the time, there's going to be resets. There's going to be updates, just like any machine. But by and large, if I have something up on here in Visual Studio Code in the middle of a PowerShell script, um, if I leave stuff open and just kill it, like I don't go log out. I'll just literally close the tab or close my remote desktop session. Yeah, and then I can log I, I do back the same into thing it. All the yeah, time. and everything's back up. It's there. It's working. I can log in and keep going with wherever I left off. Perfect. Well, I think we just about covered it. I think so. Hopefully, hopefully that covers all the details. So that is Windows three sixty five. Also known as Cloud PC. Not also to be confused known as Windows with... 11 Enterprise. <laughs> no, not Windows 11 Enterprise. Cloud it PC. is if you want to go look up the licensing for it. Okay, so it is. Right here, it's Windows 11 Enterprise. <laughs> there. Happy, there's Windows 11 Enterprise. Yes, it is Windows 11 Enterprise. You have to have a license for Windows 11 Enterprise. Um, I believe, or is it included with Cloud PC? Or is it a gray area? Uh, it, no, it's it, it, it's part of your that that's the whole thing of go look up Windows 11 Enterprise and then go look at the SKUs for Windows 11 Enterprise and then under those uh, like E3, E5 things like that, some of them include the uh, the cloud PC or AVD as well. Yes, and that's yeah. where like I know the Microsoft 365 ones, the Microsoft 365 yep. ones cover all of that licensing, so. Save yourself. Very, 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 very similar. Yep, exactly. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. Yeah. Thanks again, bud. You're welcome. I didn't get my root beer tonight. We were gone this weekend. I'm kind of sad. Next next time. Next time I'll get my root beer back. But for now, it's your turn. I've done two in a row. You get to come up with next, well, two weeks topic. (laughs) So we'll talk to you in two weeks about whatever topic it is you decide to come up with. I'll find something. All right.